So I'm not interested in you because you have come to me only because I'm available and that other woman is not. So see the moment Thomasin is out of the picture, Eustacia loses interest in Damon. I mean she cannot marry somebody who is rejected by Thomasin. Too much for her to take. Hello and welcome back to Double Pop. You have already heard the story of Hardy's novel, The Return of the Native. Uh, now we are going to begin this series on the close reading of Hardy's book. And today in this video, we are going to look at the first book, The Three Women. Don't skip any part of this video because we are going to look at the very important passages, especially the dialogues between characters and very important descriptions so that by the time you reach the end of the video you won't need to revise it again this is the first time we are doing a novel and i really look forward to your comments and suggestions in the comment box this is monami mukherjee welcome once again Since the novel, The Return of the Native, is structured almost like a tragedy, uh, we can treat the first book as the exposition where we get to know about the setting, the details about the characters, their relationships and a certain kind of idea uh, may be formed in our minds about what kind of story is this going to be. So we will look at the 11 chapters that we have here and we will focus on very important points that we uh, come across in those chapters. So the first one, a face on which time makes but little impression, will give us an idea about the setting of the whole novel. And the setting is Egden Heath. So I will read along with you uh, the lines which Hardy writes here, not all of them, I'll just skip and focus on very important ones. He begins like this. A Saturday afternoon in November was approaching the time of twilight and the vast tract of unenclosed wild known as Egdon Heath embrowned itself moment by moment. Before we go any further, I want you to focus on the words November, afternoon, twilight. All these imply a kind of ending as if something is about to end. So there is an element of foreshadowing as if Hardy is trying to tell us that this is not going to be a merry story of the springtime but a tragic tale of November twilight. He uses the expression unenclosed wild. Now wild doesn't always mean a very dense forest. It might also mean a place which is deserted where people do not want to live, where vegetation is less. And this can happen on desert areas and on heathlands. Egden Heath, I must uh, tell you once again, that it is not a real place. Egden is like uh, a symbolic place or a symbolic heath and it's like a representative place. It represents all heathland of England uh, in the Wessex. Uh, that is the region on which Hardy focuses his attention on, he writes his novels on. Overhead, the hollow stretch of whitish cloud shutting out the sky. Notice this expression. So the sky is shut out as the evening is approaching. Was as a tent which had the whole heath for its floor. So uh, right when Hardy is starting his novel, he is giving us a vast landscape where the sky is the roof and the heath is the floor. So he is going to give you something monumental, he is not going to give you domestic uh, troubles, although the story might have those elements. But nature is a very important presence in this novel. This is what Hardy tells us because he begins his novel with this chapter. I will read a few lines later. The heaven being spread with this pallid screen and the earth with the darkest vegetation, their meeting line at the horizon. Horizon is the line where the sky meets the land. So if you are standing on Egden Heath and you are looking at the horizon, the line which divides the sky and the earth, uh, you would see there is a contrast that the vegetation on earth is very dark and it is very brownish. In such contrast, the heath wore the appearance of an installment of night 
which had taken up its place before its astronomical hour was come. So, night comes at a certain astronomical hour. But in Egden, you might feel that the night has come a little before its usual time. Okay, so Heathland becomes darker uh, than uh, other places on earth. And then after a few lines, he says this beautiful expression. The face of the heath by its mere complexion added half an hour to evening. It could in like manner retard the dawn. So uh, when it was time for the sun to rise, uh, it was not a very bright dawn in Egden. Usually it takes longer uh, for Egden heath to brighten up. So it retards the dawn. It kind of delays the sunrise as it were. Sadden noon, during the noon time, especially during November, things might get very gloomy, there might be clouds. And so the weather in Egden is not very welcoming and friendly, is very, uh, well, full of uh, gloom, uh, full of darkness, something which you don't associate with happy places. So Egden is not a very welcoming place at all as this description goes. So there is a predominance of a darkness and an element of mystery and then you have these lines anticipate the frowning of storms scarcely generated and intensify the opacity of a moonless midnight. Now imagine what would happen on Egden if it is a new moon night when there is no moon. Of course that darkness will be even more horrible to be a uh, so this is what Egden is as it is presented in front of us and then Hardy makes a very unique observation he says that uh, Egden has something very human about it he says it was at present a place perfectly accordant with man's nature how is man's nature and then he defines man's nature neither ghastly hateful nor ugly Neither commonplace, unmeaning, nor tame, but like man, slighted and enduring. So, Egden has an element of humanity about it. And somehow, it is behaving as if it's a human being. And human beings are what? They are not commonplace. You might feel that um, man is a very common thing. But if you look at mankind as a whole, uh, its race compared to other animals, how it has survived uh, despite the odds, uh, that is remarkable. And that is what uh, Hardy feels connects Egden with mankind. Now, this man is not one single human being. This man is the whole generation of mankind who have survived. As with some persons who have long lived apart, solitude seemed to look out of its countenance. It had a lonely face. So, Egden, if you compare it to a man, then Egden looked like a man who has lived alone for a long time. And when a person lives alone for a long time, his face uh, reflects that loneliness. Egden, in a similar way, reflects loneliness and not just loneliness. It had a lonely face suggesting tragical possibilities. So there is an element of foreboding where it kind of gives you a hint that it's going to be a tragic story. And there is this human element which you need to focus on. And you have to remember that Heath is a character. Uh, it's not just a backdrop, but it's a participatory force. As if the Heath or nature represented through the Heath is an active uh, agent to bring about changes in the lives of human beings living on Egden Heath. And then this beautiful sentence, I love this one. The great inviolate place had an ancient permanence which the sea cannot claim. Inviolate, it, it is associated with something like a virgin person, uh, a person who is not violated. So Egden is beyond the reach of civilization. Human beings, they are machines, they have not invaded Egden yet. When you will look into the story as we go on, you will find that they follow these uh, very ancient traditions in their rituals, in their professions. They do not use machines much. 
they use their hands and their uh, human abilities more than mechanical tools uh, to uh, to survive and that is what makes Egden an inviolate place inviolate from the onslaught of scientific revolution and remember Hardy was writing this during the 1850s that phase and therefore it is very important for us to understand that Egden represents a life which Victorian England was not having access to anymore. Victorian England is the site of development, uh, the kind of progress that, that, that focused on technology. Egden is completely set away from all that. And perhaps that's why we can say Egden is more pristine in the eyes of a Victorian writer who was sick and tired of his city life, it seems. Usually we feel that the sea is a very permanent thing, don't we? But Hardy says that no, the sea is not permanent too. It changes every time water evaporates and the river, it gives back whatever water it carries to the sea. The sea is renewing itself. And he says, who can say of a particular sea that it is old, distilled by the sun, kneaded by the moon? It is renewed in a year, in a day. Or in an hour, the sea changed, the fields changed, the rivers, the villages and the people changed, yet Egden remained. If possible, memorize this one sentence and you would know what to write if you were to write on the role of Egden Heath in the return of the native. This is, this is this permanence is what matters most in this story. So what we understand about Egden Heath is that it represents permanence, it has a willpower of its own and it kind of matches human race in its ability to understand things and bring about changes. So will we see Egden Heath acting as a character here and how? How is that possible? We will find out. The second chapter gives us human beings finally. So the first chapter acts as an anticipation and the second chapter gives us some characters. And which characters are these? We see a cart uh, that is passing along this road and there's this old man who goes to the person who is walking beside the cart and tries to talk to him. So we will go through that dialogue to understand who these people are and what they are doing here. Out of the two characters, one person is a riddle man who sells uh, this colored stuff or dye to farmers with which the farmers, they color their sheep so that they understand which sheep belong to whom. So this is this riddle man who is following an ancient profession and there is this old man who comes there to him asking about uh, different things. Actually, he wants to know about this van and who is traveling inside. You have something inside there besides your load. So this old man is very curious. Yes, somebody who wants looking after because the old man notices that the little man is constantly going and checking inside the van as if he wants to make sure that the, there's a person inside and that person is fine. So the old man asks, who is there in the van that you want to look after? Yes, not long after this, a faint cry sounded from the interior. So somebody was riding in the cart, in the van, and that person emitted a small little cry. You have a child there, my man? Now this old man is getting more and more curious. No, sir, I have a woman. The deuce you have? Why did she cry out? Oh, she has fallen asleep and not been used to traveling. She is uneasy and keeps dreaming. A young woman? Yes, a young woman. So see how this uh, curiosity is building inside the old man. And finally, he wants to have a look at this woman. Uh, well, of course, that is something which the little man does not allow. And the little man feeling uncomfortable by all this prying and all this interest, he uh, decides to ask the man to simply go his own way and they part ways. After this old man leaves, the little man, he uh, just rests for some time and uh, then Hardy gives us 
a very unique scene. As the resting man looked at the barrow, he became aware that its summit. Now, what is a barrow? Barrow is like a mount. Okay, it's like a rounded, uh, you can say, hilltop place. So, it's a small barrow. And this man was looking at the barrow. And when he looked at the barrow, he became aware that its summit, that is its top, top of the barrow. Hitherto, the highest object in the whole prospect round was surmounted by something higher. That was something else was there on top of that mount. So that that mount doesn't become the highest point when he looks at the sky. And what is that? It rose from the semi-globular mound like a spike from a helmet. So as if there was a spike, such a perfect, delicate and necessary finish did the figure give to the dark pile of hills. So it was a figure of a person which this little man was looking at and it looked like a spike on a helmet. And it looked as if it was organically connected to the whole scene. Which means that it was always a part. It was not moving. It was all still. And it was so still that people, if they saw it, they would feel that it is always there on that mount, that figure. It's like a statue. The scene was strangely homogeneous. So it didn't feel as if that figure on that mount was something which has arrived. It feels as if it is always there unified with the whole setting. In that veil, the upland, the barrow and the figure above it amounted only to unity. And then when that spike started to move, of course, it felt weird because just like a tree or a stone, till now, it was looking as if that figure was like a statue. So once that figure starts to move, it appears to be very weird. The form was so much like an organic part of the entire motionless structure that to see it move would have impressed the mind as a strange phenomenon. Now, he gives us the reason why there was this movement. Why did this figure move? And before that, he gives us more information. The movement had been sufficient to show more clearly the characteristics of the figure and that it was a woman's. So, it was the figure of a woman and this woman was moving now and why was she moving? The reason of her sudden displacement now appeared with her dropping out of sight on the right side. So imagine this mount, there was this woman, she started walking down this path and after a few moments some other figure started walking up. So if you are looking at this whole scene from a distance, everything would appear as if uh, like those silhouettes or you play with your shadows on walls that is playing with your silhouettes. So no clear faces are visible, no clear bodies are visible, only shadows against the sky. So this woman is going away from this place because there are some people who are arriving with whom she doesn't want to communicate. So she is going away from that place. The only intelligible meaning in this sky-backed pantomime of silhouettes was that the woman had no relation to the forms who had taken her place, was sedulously avoiding these and had come thither for another object than theirs. She was here for something else, not for the same reason as these people are coming. Now, the people who are coming now on the mount, they are the natives of this place. They are the villagers who uh, are gathering about to have a special ritual. But they remained and established themselves. And the lonely person who hitherto had been the queen of the solitude did not at present seem likely to return. She is called the queen of solitude because she looked majestic. Okay, So she did not return to the scene. We rather get to see the people of Egden Heath, the natives of Egden Heath in the third chapter. And the name of the third chapter is the custom of the country. Now, this is a, a long uh, chapter where uh, so far as action is concerned, only a few things happen. So, if you have time, you can definitely go through the conversations uh, 
uh, between the natives and you will notice that their accent is different uh, they have uh, a different kind of grammatical structure which doesn't match with the ones which we follow and their expressions are simple uh, and their uh, way of communicating with each other has a lot of intimacy uh, when you will see uh, the so called civilized set of people here the nobles or people belonging to higher society there you would notice a kind of distance of formality when people talk to each other uh, but here you would see a certain kind of intimacy a certain kind of informal affection between uh, the natives when they communicate now before i go into the important points in their conversation i just give you a short uh, hint about why they are here it was as if these men and boys had suddenly dived into past ages and fetched there from an hour and deed which had before been familiar with this spot so they were doing something which people here uh, have done for ages and not just uh, immediate past it's talking about ancient history here the ashes of the original british pyre which blazed from that summit lay fresh and undisturbed in the barrow beneath their tread so they were recreating uh, the age old tradition of lighting fire just at the start of winter but this act of lighting of fire which is basically uh, a very natural act of man uh, and is a pagan ritual in a way this is coinciding with something very historical also okay festival fires to thor and woden woden is the god after whom wednesday is named okay so it's also uh, you can say uh, a very important god thor and woden had followed on the same ground and duly had their day indeed it is pretty well known that such blazes such fires or bonfires as this the heath men were now enjoying are rather the lineal descendants from jumbled druidical rites so rites which belong to pagan rituals druids and stuff and saxon ceremonies than the invention of popular feeling about gunpowder plot gunpowder plot uh, is you can say it, it was like a failed attempt to assassinate king james 1 uh, who was a protestant ruler and people wanted to have a catholic rule so they wanted to well assassinate him but it was a failed attempt now after this attempt there was this decree passed by the parliament that this day has to be commemorated uh, you know so that people remember that this attempt was uh, not successful and this this commemoration this remembering the day is done through lighting of bonfire but what hardy does is he shows how the historical event is absorbed into general mythologies and pagan rituals and he creates a kind of a parallel rituals here so the custom of the country that is the title of this chapter gives us this bonfire night not just as a, a reenactment of this um, guy fox day or gunpowder plot but it's like a reenactment of the rituals done for thor for woden so here we see the permanence of ecton working itself through the workings of the natives and these natives they are in tune with the uh, ways of ecton and we will see how through the course of this story that ecton has a weird way of uh, meeting out punishments and rewards and people who understand the harmony of ecton they understand the tone of ecton and they understand the dictates of ecton they are rewarded in the story and that is probably a a romantic message uh, which wordsworth or uh, coleridge might have given us that hardy is doing here anyway now we'll come to the part where grandfather cantel a very old native i talks with timothy fairway and through their conversation we get to understand about few things so the first talk about the new married folks they think that the innkeeper of quiet woman inn uh, was supposed to get married today and they should go and congratulate them 
after which there is also a conversation where they talk about the arrival of Cleomobrite who is the bride's uh, you can say cousin after which we see that their bonfires begin to get subdued the bonfire was by this time beginning to sink low for the fuel had not been of that substantial sort now they are very poor people they only can manage uh, sticks and fuel so with that they don't have a big blazing bonfire for a long time so their bonfires were getting subdued save one and this was the nearest of any the moon of the whole shining throng so there is one bonfire which is still burning and of course because it had better fuel and more amount of fuel now while this was happening there was a voice from behind hoy cried a voice from the darkness hello said fairway fairway is another native who is gathered there is there any car track up across here to mrs yo brights of blooms end so mrs yo bright she stays at the blooms end the person who is enquiring here wants to know if there is any cart track so that he can take his cart directly to mrs yo bright's house now because this is a rural place sometimes people's houses were not located at convenient places but uh, in this case mrs yo bright's house uh, of course has a cart track well yes you can get up the vale below here with time the track is rough but if you have got a light your horses may pick along with care have you brought your cart far up neighbor edelman i have left it in the bottom about half a mile back i stepped out in front to make sure of the way as it's night time and i hadn't been here for so long so we understand that this is a riddle man who is making this inquiry and he wants to reach mrs yobright's house so we can understand that the person in his van is none other than mrs yobright's niece now when he has just left right then mrs yobright comes to the same place why it is mrs yobright said fairway mrs yobright not 10 minutes ago a man was here asking for you a riddle man what did he want he didn't tell us something to sell i suppose what it can be i am at a loss to understand so she doesn't know why the little man should even ask for her anyway finally when she gets to meet the little man and his van he understands that things have gone seriously wrong with her niece and then we come to the fourth chapter she has a conversation with the little man and after knowing that her niece that is thomas in your bright is in the van she straight away wants to go and have a look after she sees thomas in just look at the conversation here and pay very close attention oh yes it is i aunt she cried so thomas in is very upset i know how frightened you are and how you cannot believe it but all the same it is i who have come home like this and then look at reaction of mrs yo bright tamsin tamsin oh my dear girl and she starts kissing the young woman so we feel that oh this is such a cordial relationship and mrs yo bright is so gentle and so loving tamsin was now on the verge of a sob so mrs yo bright goes on comforting tamsin and then the little man says okay uh, i'm leaving now then uh you to be with each other the little man goes away and right when he goes away and we uh, see a very peculiar thing happening there is a change in tone of mrs yo bright and after a few further words they parted little man moving onward with his van and the two women remaining standing in the road as soon as the vehicle and its driver had withdrawn so far as to be beyond all possible reach of her voice mrs yobray turned to her knees now thomasin what's the meaning of this disgraceful performance so till now she was all kissing and comforting her and now she is this very stern guardian now don't think that she is cruel or she doesn't love thomasin she loves her but in front of the little man she doesn't want to 
act as a person who is trying to discipline her in any way. But Mrs. Yobright, when she is alone, she really shows her displeasure and in a very no-nonsense way, she wants an explanation. Chapter 5, Thomasin is very upset because just five minutes back, she had felt that my aunt is not going to, uh, you know, rebuke me and now she is scolding me in this way and she is visibly very upset. It means just what it seems to mean. I am not married. Excuse me for humiliating you, aunt, by this mishap. I'm sorry for it, but I cannot help it. Me? Think of yourself first. So it's not about her honor or prestige that Mrs. Zubrat is worried about. She is worried about that girl. That is for sure. But her expression is harsh. She is a disciplinarian. Earlier she had not wanted Thompson to marry this man. And now that this whole thing has turned into a, this kind of a fiasco, she wants her to marry that man. But then nothing is happening as planned and she is visibly upset. It was nobody's fault when we got there the parson wouldn't marry us because of some trifling irregularity in the license. What irregularity? I don't know. Mr. Wildleaf can explain. I did not think when I went away this morning that I should come back like this. So of course Thomasin is very upset and she doesn't even know the real uh, legal reason why they could not be married that day. They decide to go to Wildleaf's house and now we have the description of Damon Wildeve. He was quite a young man and of the two properties, form and motion. So he had two things. He had form and he had motion. The latter first attracted the eye in him. So he had a good looking body but more than that he moved a lot. So when you saw Damon Wildeve, you would first see him moving. Then you would focus on his features. The grace of his movement was singular. It was the pantomimic expression of a lady-killing character. And then, uh, come to the last part of this description. Altogether, he was one in whom no man would have seen anything to admire and in whom no woman would have seen anything to dislike. I don't know what Tad is trying to imply here that women have no sense of beauty or what or they are charmed by uh, charmers who are basically worthless. Uh, Hardy is patriarchal, he can't help but be one, even though he has created immortal characters like Jude uh, and Eustacia, of course, but still he is patriarchal uh, at times like these. When they reach Damon's house, Damon wants to speak with Thomasin all alone and when they are alone, Thomasin asks him, and look at the, I was talking to you about uh, intimacy between natives when they talk and look at the formality between lovers uh, when they uh, belong to higher society, there is no intimacy at all. Damon, what do you mean to do about me? Do about you? Yes, those who don't like you whisper things which at moments make me doubt you. We mean to marry, I suppose, don't we? Of course we do. We have only to go to Budmouth on Monday and we marry at once. Then do let us go. And then she is ashamed of asking this because usually, traditionally, women are supposed to be the quiet ones Men are supposed to ask uh, for their hands in marriage and she feels that somehow her honor is called into question because she is begging Damon to marry her. And Damon says, yes, real life is never at all like that. But I don't care personally if it never takes place. I can live without you. Now she is trying to act as if she doesn't really need Damon. Uh, she's only thinking about her aunt and her reputation. It is aunt I think of. She is so proud and thinks so much of her family respectability that she will be cut down with mortification if this story should get abroad before it is done. My cousin Klim too will be much wounded. So what she's trying to say here? She is saying that look, I don't care if I get married to you or not. But since my aunt and my cousin would feel bad, Therefore, we should get married. And of course, Damon is offended and he says, then he will be very unreasonable. In fact, you all are rather unreasonable. So Damon makes um, a general statement here. And right then they hear that the natives have come to congratulate them for their marriage, which has not taken place. 
and of course Damon uh, does not want to face them like that. So Damon goes and tries to talk with them on different things. And in the meantime, Thomasin and Mrs. Eubright, they leave. So when Wild Dave came back from the, the, the front uh, room, he saw that the room was empty. Wild Dave came back, put on his hat, took the bottle, there was a bottle, and left the house, turning the key in the door, for there was no guest at the inn tonight. As soon as he was on the road, the little bonfire on Mr. Vernap again met his eye. Still waiting, are you, my lady? So see, he notices the bonfire which Eustacia Vi has lit. And he is going to go there. He tries to stop himself. Goes to a different place, does some other work. Again, he thinks that I must go. So we see the kind of pull that he feels towards Eustacia and he can't stop himself and he says yes by heaven I must go to her I suppose. Instead of turning in the direction of home he pressed on rapidly by a path under a rain barrow towards what was evidently a signal light. So it was a signal light. Then we have this very beautiful chapter focused completely on Eustacia Y. And the special thing about her is she carries two very unique things. Number one, a telescope. And number two, an hourglass. And she somehow loves to look at the hourglass uh, to see how time is converted into something very material. Okay, so she looks like uh, she wants to control something. She looks through the telescope to check the movements of Damon Wildeev. And then finally, we see that she goes and talks to a child uh, who is helping her build the bonfire. And the name of the child is Johnny Nansach. Johnny is not very happy right now because he has lit a big bonfire, but he has no other children to play with here. So he wants to go away to his friends, but uh, Eustacia wants him to stay. Stay a little longer and I will give you a crooked sixpence, said Eustacia more gently. Put in one piece of wood every two or three minutes, but not too much at once. I am going to walk along the ridge a little longer, but I shall keep on coming to you. And if you hear a frog jump into the pond with a flounce like a stone thrown in, be sure you run and tell me because it is a sign of rain. So if you hear a stone dropping in the pond, you should come and tell me. Why? Why does she say this? Because this was the thing that Damon used to do. He used to come, throw a stone in the pond to signal that he has arrived. Now Eustacia doesn't want to miss that signal. She is going off to the other part, this is the ridge, and she wants Johnny to inform her if there is a sound of a stone. But she cannot tell Johnny that if you hear a man dropping a stone, then Johnny would come to know about Damon. They are having this secret affair. So she says, if you hear a frog jump into the pond, then come and tell me. So this is how she is trying to uh, use uh, our little Johnny Nansach. While Eustacia looked on from this distance, the boy's form visibly started. Now Johnny heard something. He slid down the bank and ran across towards the wide gate. Well, said Eustacia. A half frog has jumped into the pond. Yes, I heard him. Then it is going to rain and you had better go home. You will not be afraid. So she wants him gone now. And well, she gives him the sixpence and he goes. Now we see the man who has thrown the stone into the pond. It's Wild Eve. Wild Wildeef comes and he is not in a very pleasant mood because he is torn between two things now. I have come. You give me no peace. Why do you not leave me alone? I have seen your bonfire all the evening. At this unexpectedly repressing manner in her lover, the girl seemed to repress herself also. Of course you have seen my fire. Look at the tone. Do lovers speak like this? Maybe they do, but then only under circumstances where they are not sure of each other. 
there is a certain kind of nervousness and a certain kind of battle going on between the two. It's as if they are trying to win something out of this relationship and not give themselves. So this is a different kind of romance that we are witnessing here. Of course, you have seen my fire. Why shouldn't I have a bonfire on the 5th of November? I knew it was meant for me. So Damon is saying that you have lit this bonfire for me, not for any 5th of November ritual. How did you know it? I have had no word with you since you, you chose her and walked about with her and deserted me entirely as if I had never been your life and soul so irretrievably. So there had been a time when Eustacia had an affair with Damon. Then she saw him drift towards Thompson. So she is saying that I have never uh, wanted to be with you since you chose another woman. And then there is a lot of heated, passionate conversation, after which Eustacia says that she feels that he has not married Thomasin because of her. But I don't mind it and I do forgive you now that you have not married her and have come back to me. Who told you that I had not married her? My grandfather, he took a long walk today and he was coming home. So that was the old man, her grandfather. He overtook some person who told him of a broken off wedding. He thought it might be yours and I knew it was. Does anybody else know? I suppose not. Now, Damon, do you see why I lit my signal fire? So she says that I lit my signal fire because I knew that you have not married Thomasina. And I thought that maybe because of me, you have not married her. So I lit the fire to call you. And then she says, if you own to me that the wedding is broken off because you love me best, I don't think it would be a good policy. You would get to know the extent of your power. So Valdiv is playing with words now and he says that if I told you that you are the reason why I did not marry Thomasin, then you would feel very powerful. I don't want you to feel that way. Eustacia doesn't want to appear very greedy or very desperate for Damon here. So she says, I merely lit that fire because I was dull, I was bored. And I thought I would get a little excitement by calling you up and triumphing over you as the witch of Ender called up Samuel. I determined you should come and you have come. I have shown my power. A mile and a half hither and a mile and a half back again to your home. Three miles in the dark for me. Have I not shown my power? So you say she is saying that you are worried about me showing my power. That's why you are saying that I am the reason why you have not married Thomas. But see, I have already shown my power. I have dragged you out of your house for three miles. You will be walking today for me. While there is not somebody who is going to give up that easily and he says, I know you too well, my Eustacia. I know you too well. There isn't a note in you which I don't know. And that hot little bosom couldn't play such a cold-blooded trick to save its life. I saw a woman on Rain Barrow at dusk, looking down towards my house. I think I drew out you before you drew out me. So, you dragged me out of my house by lighting a bonfire. But I dragged you out of your house to light that bonfire. So I dragged you out before you dragged me out. So of course, I have more power. So this is a power game that they're playing. And somehow, this is not the proper essence of love. Love uh, is not about snatching and declaring power. It is about giving up things that you have for the other person and they are not ready to give up anything at all. In the seventh chapter, we have a completely dedicated section on Eustacia Vai, where she is actually called the Queen of Night. Hardy is in love with Eustacia and he does not leave any stone unturned to declare that. Eustacia Vai was the raw material of a divinity. He starts like this. On Olympus, she would have done well with a little preparation. So he is equating Eustacia with pagan goddess. And then he also gives us the reason why she is here. Why did a woman of this sort 
live on Egdon Heath. Budmouth was her native place. And then he gives us an account that she was born outside Egdon, but after the death of her parents, her grandfather had to take her in and he lived in Egdon Heath. Therefore, they now uh, live here. She hated the change. She felt like one banished. But here she was forced to abide. So it was not a life she wanted for herself. And so we see our Eustacia. Note the term of endearment here. Our Eustacia that her uses. For at times she was not altogether unlovable. Arriving at that stage of enlightenment which feels that nothing is worthwhile. And filling up the spare hours of her existence. So this is a woman who is not somebody you can ignore and she is not unlovable. The problem is she has nothing to do here. And what is she doing here? Filling up the spare hours of her existence by idealizing Waldiv for want of a better object. Since there is nobody better here available, well, Waldiv is her only choice. Chapter 8, comparatively insignificant except for the thing that here Riddle Man gets to know from Johnny Nunsuch about Wildiv and he thinks that he must do something about it. As we progress to the next chapter, we see that Riddle Man is willing to do something here and he directly goes to Eustacia Vai. But when he reaches there, he hears or rather overhears a conversation between Eustacia and Wildiv where he hears them almost fighting with each other. Um, Eustacia trying to uh, exert her power over Damon. Damon is somehow trying to tell her that he has no other option but to marry Thomasin. And he actually tells these things to her. One moment you are too tall, another moment you are too do nothing, another too melancholy, another too dark, another I don't know what, except that you are not the whole world to me. But you used to be, my dear. But you are a pleasant lady to know and nice to meet. And I dare say as sweet as ever, almost. Eustacia is, of course, very angry. But she knows that she cannot be with Wildiv because this man has chosen another woman over her. During this conversation, at the end of it, there is a very important line that Eustacia says about the heat. It is my cross, my shame, and will be my death. And this acts as kind of a premonition, you can say, foreboding. And we will see how this is actually uh, enacted uh, in the course of the story. Riddleman is visibly very upset. He goes to Eustacia and this conversation happens in chapter 10. He wants Eustacia to persuade Damon so that he marries uh, Thomasin. Riddleman offers Eustacia an escape because he knows that Eustacia wants to leave it. And that is why she is uh, trying to have this affair with Damon. And he offers her a job opportunity to be a companion to an old woman. But Eustacia is not somebody who really wants to serve anybody. She is too queenly for that and she doesn't want to work that way. So she refuses it. She does not show much interest here. At the end of that chapter, she emphatically says when little man leaves that I'm not going to leave Damon Wildiv, I'm going to have him. So we see that little man's efforts did not uh, appear to be much fruitful. After that, in chapter 11, something very interesting happens. Mrs. Yobright, she is so, you can say, wise so far as um, human society is concerned. She has extreme wisdom there. She simply goes to Wildiv and before going to Wildiv, she gets a proposal from the riddle man that he wants to marry Thomasin and of course she is not interested. But anyway, she uses this. How does she use this? She goes to Wildiv and says, a new proposal has been made to me, which has rather astonished me. It will affect Thomasin greatly, and I have decided it should at least be mentioned to you. Yes, what is it? It is, of course, in reference to her future. And then she says that somebody else has wanted to marry Thomasin. And, of course, Wildiv is saying, can you tell the name? And she doesn't mention any name here. 
Now, when Damon knows about this, he says, well, if she wants him, I suppose she must have him. And he goes to Eustacia now to kind of tell her that he's available now. And he says that, well, I'm free now. We can be together. But Eustacia is not interested. And Wildeem is very curious now. You can be painfully frank. You loved me a month ago warmly enough to go anywhere with me. So he proposes her to go to America with him, to Bristol. But Eustacia is replying in a different way now. And you love Thomason. Yes, perhaps. That was where the reason lay. I don't hate her now. Exactly. The only thing is that you can no longer get her. Come, no taunts, Eustacia, or we shall quarrel. If you don't agree to go with me and agree shortly, I shall go by myself. If you don't come, I'll go all by myself. Or try Thomason again, Damon. How strange it seems that you could have married her or me indefinitely and only have come to me because I am cheapest. Yes, yes, it is true. There was a time when I should have exclaimed against a man of that sort and been quite wild. But it is all past now. So I am not interested in you because you have come to me. Only because I am available and that other woman is not. So see, the moment Thomasin is out of the picture, Eustacia loses interest in Damon. As, as if Damon's worth, his value has gone down. And she won't accept him now. I mean, she cannot marry somebody who is rejected by Thomasin. Too much for her to take. So, finally we see that Mrs. Yobright gets her way. And this chapter ends with this conversation between Eustacia and her grandfather, where he talks about Clem Yobright. Young Clem Yobright, as they call him, is coming home next week to spend Christmas with his mother. He is a fine fellow by this time, it seems. I suppose you remember him. I never saw him in my life. Ah, true. He left before you came here. I will remember him as a promising boy. Where has he been living all these years? In that rookery of pomp and vanity? Paris, I believe. And the trigger word. Paris is really a trigger word for Eustacia. And she kind of starts to have this anticipation in her. The kind of anticipation which Hardy wants the readers to feel as well. That what will happen after Klim comes? What kind of person is Klim? He is from the city. What change is he going to bring here? And if this book is named after him, how is he going to be a native who returns? So in our second book, we will go through the rising action and we'll see how things get more complex between characters and how the plot progresses through different diversions and subplots. Thank you for staying with me in this close reading. I hope to see you all very soon in my next video. Till then, stay happy, stay subscribed. A very happy new year to all of you. May all of you get lots and lots of marks in your exams. This is what I'm going to signing off. Bye-bye.